This conference will now be recorded. Welcome in, everybody. Today's lecture, we're going to be talking about Chapter 30, which is going to be musculoskeletal trauma inside your textbook. So this is our learning readiness. Make sure that you are reading the chapter, specifically honing in on the objectives and the key terms. So our case study information, we have 45-year-old Dominique Foster rushes out of the door of her office building, running late as usual, she thinks. As she steps off the curb on in the parking lot, she slips on a patch of ice and pitches to the left. Her left arm shoots out reflexively to stop her fall. As she lands on her outstretched hand, Dominique simultaneously hears and feels a snap just above her left wrist. So what are some safety considerations for the EMTs and patient in this scenario? So first and foremost, we know that she slipped on a patch of ice. We know that she's gonna be out in public, so there's gonna be a large group gathering. And then also, we don't know where she's correlated as far as uh, local traffic too. So we gotta take that into account. What signs and symptoms should the EMT look for in their assessment? So first, what we're going to do is we're going to do a trauma assessment to see and eliminate any C-spine precautions. So we arrive on scene, scene safety, BSI, number of patients, additional resources, mechanism of injury, nature of illness, identify ourselves, go through our ABCs and our patient responsiveness and determine their specific chief complaint. So Dominique, most likely is going to be complaining of left arm pain. So before I dive into that patient assessment criteria, I'm going to ask her if she fell and hit her head, if she's experiencing a neck, head, or back pain, and then I'm going to check CMS. Okay, if all those things are lining up and she doesn't have a complaint about that, then I'm going to do it. go ahead and do an isolated trauma assessment based on her specific mechanism of injury, and then really focus in on that left hand and wrist. So our introduction, we're gonna go over to the injuries of the bones, joints, muscles, any interventions, and then also classifying whether they are severe and or minor. So just a brief review on the musculoskeletal system, it gives the body its shape, it protects internal organs, it provides movement, it also creates minerals and produces red blood cells as well. So our muscles, we have three different types. We have voluntary, which is gonna be our skeletal muscles and that allows movement. So this is gonna be the major muscle mass of the patient's body. We have involuntary and or smooth muscles. So those are gonna be our in internal organs such as our stomach, our intestines, our lungs, and then very similar to our involuntary organs, excuse me, involuntary muscles are going to be our cardiac muscles. Then we have tendons and ligaments. So tendons are always going to connect muscle to bone. Ligaments connect bone to bone. And then we have cartilage, which is an extension of the bone, oftentimes of non-porous tissue uh, in comparison to the very porous tissue that is our bones. So this allows the bones to ride over each other with movement and little friction for that cartilage usage. So there we can see the ligaments connecting the bone to the bone. We have the tendons which attach the muscle to the bone. Um, when we are doing our patient assessment and diving into whether it could be a ligament or a tendon, nothing really is gonna change our patient assessment and or our treatments, because we're still gonna stabilize in place, provide pain control, um, and then conduct our isolated trauma assessment if they are complaining of a specific focal point um, for their mechanism of injury. So there's our structure of our joint. We see that cartilage tissue, we see the bone, how they meet and then the tendons connecting those bone to bone. Now joints do have the tendency to slip that cartilage and then <clears throat> damage those tendons. And as a result, we're gonna see a dislocation, which we will talk about in future slides. Types of motion within the skeletal system, we got flexion, extension, adduction, abduction, rotation, and circumduncial. 
So all of these different portions are gonna tailor to the different parts of the body and how it specifically moves. So if we bend our arm up, that's flexion. If we extend our arm out, that's extension, rotation, utilizing our neck muscles, um, and then rotating our wrist. So when everything's working together, our body system should be moving relatively easily without pain. And then the skeletal system as a whole, it's divided up in two categories. We have the axial skeleton and the appendicular skeleton. So axial, that's gonna be composed of the head, the thorax, and the vertebrae column. The appendicular skeletal system is made up of the extremities, shoulders, and the pelvis. There's a brief review of the different bones within the skeletal system. What we're concerned about is major bone mass and injuries associated with that. So we take a look at this picture, the sternum, the spinal column, the skull, uh, the humerus, the femur, the pelvis, all of those have very large bone mass. And as a result, there's a lot of blood vessels that actually circulate around those bone masses. So when we see a substantial injury to one of those major bones, we gotta be thinking about pain control, and we have to be thinking about if those great blood vessels were disrupted, how much internal bleeding is gonna be correlated with that specific injury. So injuries to the bones and the joints. So a fracture, this is gonna be a break within the bone, um, a wide variety of different fractures that we could see. Oftentimes we're gonna see a displacement of that bone that's gonna compromise the surrounding tissue. So it's not just the bone itself that's gonna cause a problem, but it's also the disruption of the tissue surrounding that specific fracture site. Some individuals are more prone to fractures. As we can see, osteoporosis, that's a degenerative bone disorder. Oftentimes we see that with our patients who are considered geriatrics. So with those simple fall from a standing position where all of us in the class might not affect us, somebody who's got osteoporosis or other bone um, degenerative disorders may actually cause that fracture. Our signs and symptoms, we arrive on scene and we'll continue to play off that case study. Could be pain and tenderness uh, on Dominique's left wrist, left hand area. We could see a deformity or a dislocation. So this is a great opportunity to compare the unaffected to the affected side in the event that she's got normal baseline anatomy and pathophysiology. Could be complaining of weakness and or uh, loss of sensation within that extremity, then also the inability to move that extremity. And when you're checking CMS, you might not be able to feel that pulse. So here, a bunch of different types of fractures that can occur. Again, we are gonna treat all of these the same. We're gonna splint in a position of comfort. We're gonna realign in the event that we don't have CMS just one time. And then we're gonna go ahead and splint in place. So difference between open and closed fractures, and this is where our treatment plan is gonna be a little bit different. So we have a closed fracture in which that fracture has not protruded through the skin. An open fracture, that bone actually protrudes through the skin. So when we have a closed injury, our concern is splinting, pain management, and making sure that that injury site does not cause any more harm than it already is doing. When we have an open fracture, we are concerned about bleeding control and then also making sure that an infection doesn't set in a place. And this is where we wrap that with gauze, try and keep it sterile as possible. And then we're gonna go ahead and splint in a position of comfort. So there, good example, we have a lower leg injury. So this could be associated with the ankle itself or a tib fib and it looks like it is the fibula that's actually affected on this, or the tibia. So that fracture, obviously this is a deformity, and we can see that the circulation might not be there because we can see the difference between skin color between the left foot, or excuse me, the right foot and the right leg. 
there we have an open fracture. So again, our concern is bleeding control and maintaining an isolation between the environment and then also that open wound and then splinting in place. So here, radius and ulna is affected. So as far as treatments go, I'm gonna check CMS. If I got proper CMS, I'm gonna go ahead and splint it into place. If we have a dislocation or a fracture like this and we're not getting good CMS, so I'm checking for a pulse, not feeling a pulse, they're not able to move their digits, um, they can't feel me touching you, you have one chance to go ahead and realign that to try and get perfusion back to the distal portion of that extremity. So complications that we can see with a fracture. Hemorrhage, whether it's internal or external, they could see excess, extensive tissue damage, depending on where it was affected and what bone muscle was affected. We could see infection, predominantly when we have those open fractures. And then again, we could have interruption of the blood supply, which is why it's so important that we're checking CMS, both before and afterwards with applications of that splint. Not all extremity injuries are gonna result in a fracture. So it could be also a strain. And so this is gonna be from overexertion of overstretching causes from that muscle fiber and they tear and it's a substantial tear. So individuals who are in weightlifting, when they weightlift, they actually tear those muscles. So and that's gonna be considered a minor tear. Somebody who's involved in a sports related injury and they tear their ACL or their MCL um, or a severe muscle tear, that's gonna be considered more significant. A sprain, this is gonna be from a joint capsule, uh, usually involving the connective tissue, involving the ligaments. So a lot of pain associated with this, could see some swelling, discoloration, and oftentimes patients actually describe a sprain as more painful than a fracture. When we have a dislocation, so this is gonna be a displacement of bones in a joint, could damage blood vessels and nerves. A strain, again, and that's gonna be an injury to the muscle mass. How we're gonna treat that is the same. We're gonna go ahead and stabilize, check CMS, and splint into place. There we can see a disc dislocation of that knee joint. So I'm gonna check CMS. I'm gonna palpate around that knee. I'm gonna look for any other types of injuries. And then I'm gonna go ahead and splint that and provide pain control with my cold packs. So injury that is characterized by overstretching and tearing muscle fibers. So right off the bat with any of our EMS related questions, we can eliminate almost immediately two. Dislocation and fracture, I can eliminate those right off the bat because it doesn't describe any type of um, classification with bones, which fractures predominantly and dislocations involve either bones slipping out of place, which is our dislocation, or it actually a break within that bone. So then when I'm looking at strain and or sprain, so remember sprain usually involves the tendons and ligaments, strain is gonna involve the muscle fibers. So I'm gonna go ahead and select A. Other types of injuries. So general injury considerations that we gotta be thinking of. Um, everybody's gonna be displaying different signs and symptoms associated with an injury site. So some individuals are really good at responding to pain, others are not. Um, depending on that injury, they're gonna have different types of referred pain. So make sure that you're doing a very good patient assessment with these individuals. <clears throat> the force from that musculoskeletal injury oftentimes is gonna have secondary injuries comprised of it because that energy travels up that body in a linear portion until it actually finds a curve. And that's why we see when individuals fall, a lot of times they're complaining of wrist pain or elbow pain or shoulder pain. Now, as far as mechanism of injuries and that force and energy, 
we could see different types of force associated with the mechanism of injury. We could have direct force, so that's a direct impact. So an example of this, let's say a hockey-related injury where somebody gets checked, that's direct force. Indirect force, so this is gonna be an injury impact, one end of a limb causing injury some distance away. So Dominique who fell, landed on their left wrist, that energy could be transferred up to the left shoulder, so they might have left wrist pain and then also left shoulder pain. And then we have twisting force, so part of the extremity remains stationary while the rest twists. We see this most predominantly in sports-related injuries, specifically with football and hockey and or motor vehicle accidents. So our critical fractures, where we're majorly concerned, large bones, femur and pelvis, because there is a potential of substantial blood loss associated with those. So for a femur, we could be losing at approximately 1,500 liters of blood loss. And then with the pelvic injury, we could lose about 3,000 liters, uh, or excuse me, 3,000 milliliters of blood loss <clears throat> from that injury site. 